It is a cloudy day over the shallow seas and large islands that will one day be the shores of England and Wales. While marine reptiles dominate just beneath the waves, on the land masses dotted across the area, large dinosaurs are less common, as there simply isn't enough resources to support them, and moving from island to island can be fraught with danger. So the most common reptiles you will see above the waves are the pterosaurs. Their ability to fly, making large stretches of ocean far less of a hindrance. In the early Jurassic, many of these pterosaurs are still small. In fact, very few have wingspans above 2 meters. Most rely on the ocean for prey, but this is not the case for Dimorphodon. Early in the morning, these fearsome looking pterosaurs can be seen perched in trees, waking from their slumber stretching out their wings and opening their jaws wide in long yawns. While they don't live in family groups, they stick together in mobs, similar to seagulls. They compete with each other and don't look out for each other. But it's better for everyone's safety if they stick together, even if it is loosely. Their massive heads hold multiple types of teeth, which is odd for a reptile. The name Dimorphodon means to form tooth. Their long, rigid tails help them to keep steady during flight, but Dimorphodon are relatively poor flyers, as their wings are quite short and their limbs are well built for terrestrial locomotion. Because of this, they don't do a whole lot of flying, but if danger arises or they have to fly between islands, they are more than capable, if a little unwilling. A group of twelve have risen from their slumber. Each one opens up their wings, and then proceeds to fall off their branches, gliding to the ground gracefully before landing amongst the ferns and leaf litter. A second group glides in the opposite direction, heading towards the shore. Though they do not dive into the water like some of their relatives, the beach can be a suitable place to look for carrion. Everything from fish to massive marine reptiles such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs can wash up and it is often the Dimorphodon that are first at a carcass. As the second group climb up various trees that are close to the sandy beaches, their keen eyes can't pick out any potential meals. Perhaps today isn't a day for free seafood. The ones that stayed in the forest have spent their time more actively searching for a meal, from rummaging through the leaf litter to scurrying up trees. This area has an abundance of food, they just have to be able to find and catch it. Everything from small mammals and reptiles to large insects are potential prey. Once they seize something in their long jaws, there is almost no chance of escape. One Dimorphodon hears rustling, and beneath the leaves he sees a lizard. Darting his head forward, he bites down to where he thinks the small reptile will be, but lifts up his jaws holding nothing but dry vegetation. He then begins to chase running on all four limbs after the tasty morsel that he only catches glimpses of beneath the leaf litter. He darts right, then left, then right again, his large head snapping back and forth, mostly following the sound of its movements. But then it makes a mistake, as it runs up a log. Now out in the open, the small pterosaur can see him clearly. The Dimorphodon leaps onto the log and scurries after the lizard right behind his prey, heading for the end of the log. The lizard jumps, but the long jaws of the Dimorphodon snap shut in the blink of an eye, snaring the unlucky prey in his jaws by the tail. The successful pterosaur doesn't even have time to catch his breath, before a second Dimorphodon crawls up and latches onto the lizard's exposed upper body, and pulls back trying to pry away his prize. The first Dimorphodon digs his claws into the log and pulls backwards. After a brief back and forth, the lizard is split in two, and both reptiles fly back. Each gets up and swallows their half of their catch, but the first Dimorphodon isn't happy about sharing, and squawks at the intruder before leaping at him, arms outstretched. The second Dimorphodon is quick on his feet, and swivels around before running away from his attacker. Both scuttle out of view, their screeching fading into the distance. The other Dimorphodon ignore the squabbling duo, and continue foraging. One has caught an arboreal mammal, about the size of a modern mouse, and is smacking it against the branch of a tree to kill it quickly. Another has found a large beetle, 
She neatly grabs it with the tip of her jaws before crunching it with her teeth and swallowing the crushed remains. Across the forest floor, the flying reptiles search and squabble, but they are not the only predators here. There is the sound of fast footsteps that don't belong to the pterosaurs. Looking up, they see a two-meter coelophysoid, Draco Raptor. It had appeared out of nowhere and was running towards the flock. Some take to the wing, while others scurry up the trunks of trees, but one male stands his ground. He rises up on his hind legs and spreads his wings out, flapping them angrily while screeching harshly. His intimidation attempt doesn't work. It only makes him an obvious target for the dinosaur. The Dracoraptor charges his victim, but the Dimorphodon just keeps flapping and screeching, even as he is tackled to the ground by his opponent. There was a brief struggle as the pterosaur tried to bite the Dracoraptor, but in response the larger predator pins his head under one foot and bites down on the chest and neck. The Dimorphodon doesn't go down quickly, or quietly, but eventually the carnivorous dinosaur secures his meal. During this, the remaining Dimorphodon have taken off, retreating further into the forest, and soon catch up with the group that went to the beach earlier. Evidently, there was nothing there worth feeding on. And so they spread out and return to foraging, hoping to get a meal and not become one. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the oldest known pterosaurs in terms of both discovery and age. Dimorphodon. Dimorphodon's first remains were discovered by the famous Mary Anning in Dorset of England in 1828, a region that is now called the Jurassic Coast. Mary Anning found the partial skeleton that lacked a skull and added it to her extensive collection that she accumulated throughout her life. A year after, famous scientist William Buckland would acquire the fossil and in 1835 would release a full report naming it as a new species of Pterodactylus, that being Pterodactylus micronix. Later, in 1858, another famous scientist, Richard Owen, would find two additional specimens this time with skull material. This was more than enough to show that it was a very different genus to Pterodactylus, and so was renamed to Dimorphodon macronix. The genus name means two form tooth, as it has two types of teeth in its jaws, and the species name meaning large claw, as it has, well, large claws on its forelimbs. Additional specimens have been found. But despite being known for almost two centuries, there is only one species of Dimorphodon, and it currently sits at a very basal level in the Pterosauria family. This is in part because Dimorphodon is very old, living in what is now the UK, during the Cimorian stage of the early Jurassic, between 201 and 189 million years ago. In life, it grew to one meter long from nose to tail tip, with a wingspan being 1.45 meters across, and only weighing about one kilogram. Being so old, it shouldn't be too surprising that the Morphodon doesn't have the most efficiently built wings. They are quite small for its size, with the wing finger being only slightly longer than the forearm. This has been a primary reason why it's thought that it was a rather poor flyer, but we'll get back to that later. The body is compact, but a bit more barrel-like than later pterosaurs of similar size. The tail is long, containing 30 vertebra, and though the six at the base were short and flexible, the rest increase in size the further along the tail, making it more and more stiff the closer you get to the tail tip. The tail may have had a rampharynchus-like fan on the end. However, this is just a theory at the moment. The neck was short, but quite strong, as it had to hold up its massive head. The skull on average was 23 centimeters long all on its own, and while very tall and very long, was mostly hollow with large gaps in the bone called fenestra. The thin bones of the skull were so efficiently evolved that Richard Owen compared them to the supporting arches of bridges, saying they were the most economically constructed of any animal he had seen. 
lying in its jaws were its namesake, the multiple types of teeth. For the record, most reptiles only have one type of teeth in their jaws. At the front of the top jaw were five fang-like teeth, while behind them were an unknown number of small sharp teeth. On the lower jaw were five long conical teeth, followed by 30 to 40 small pointed teeth in the shape of lancets. So what was it biting into with this very dentition? Well, like most pterosaurs, it was first thought to snap up fish from the ocean, as it was found in an area full of aquatic animal remains. But as time went on, its diet has been more speculated on and changed throughout the centuries. Another theory put forward was that it was an insectivore, as Dimorphodon's neck and jaw muscles gave it a low bite force, but was capable of snapping its jaws closed very quickly. More recent research, including that done by Mark Witten, theorized that though it may have eaten insects, its diet was closer to that of a terrestrial carnivore, as it was too large to rely solely on invertebrates, and microware on its teeth point more at it consuming small vertebrates, as opposed to other pterosaurs known to be insectivores. To add on to this, let's look at how the animal actually moved in life. As said earlier, Dimorphodon had rather short wings for its size, and its limbs were quite well built. It definitely wasn't built for soaring long distances, and likely only made short flights, spending the majority of its time walking on the ground or scurrying along trees. This may appear odd for an animal that's seemingly built for flight, but there are many birds today that spend a lot of time on the ground, especially in forests, even building their nests on the ground, only taking flight when they really need to, and it seems to be a similar lifestyle to what Dimorphodon was doing. It was even put forward that it could run on its hind legs at one point, though that's highly unlikely, since as far as we know from evidence like footprints and their limiting anatomy, pterosaurs in general were universally quadrupeds. Before all this, the modern image of Dimorphodon is one of a short-range flyer that hunted small terrestrial prey, likely running them down and snapping them up with its long jaws. Of course, like most predators, Dimorphodon was likely an opportunistic hunter that would take anything it could catch and fit down its throat. As it had multiple types of teeth, it was well equipped to go after a wide selection of prey. Now this does raise the question, were Dimorphodon's wings so short because it simply had an evolved, more efficient way of flying? Or that its ancestors were quite good at flying, but because of its more terrestrial lifestyle, it was losing its ability to fly in favour of better running and climbing? I have always thought there had to be at least one species of pterosaur that became fully terrestrial at some point during the Mesozoic, but as of yet we haven't found one, so it remains a theory on my part but there are plenty of modern birds that have become fully terrestrial for multiple different reasons. Dimorphanon is quite a popular sight in various forms of media, even if most people can't name it at first glance. Such as in the Jurassic World franchise, where it is basically given an almost gremlin-like design. Based on past artwork, I fully understand why it is given such a role. However, my favourite depiction of it is definitely this artwork by Mark Whitten, showing it as a fluffy, active animal with a straighter tail and the theorized tail vein on the end. But what do you think of Dimorphodon? And for my question of the week, do you prefer the smaller bird-sized pterosaurs or the massive, sometimes plane-sized pterosaurs that came later? And why? What lesser-known pterosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? Until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.